Hello friends, my name is Katherine Tuttle. I'm the pastor of Wilbur Community Church in Wilbur, Washington. And this video you're watching is a part of our ongoing series, Together in Spirit. It's something that we started at the beginning of this COVID-19 crisis. Now today is Palm and Passion Sunday, and I feel like this is an especially hard Sunday to be separated from one another. So I'm so glad that you are here with me this morning watching this video so that we can have uh, a service together, a time of, of prayer, a time of learning and growing, and a time of supporting one another when we all need some extra support. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we begin with our prayer of the day, I wanted to share with you something I learned this Lent, and maybe at this point in the season you've already heard this, but just in case you haven't, I wanted to share uh, a new word that, that came to my attention. Now, we began this season in my Bible study with this list of terms and definitions, and one of them was the actual word Lent, which means to, to lengthen, and it comes from the Old English uh, word to for lengthening, and uh, it refers to the the drawing out of the days um, with the sun becoming more prevalent in the sky. But there's also a, a Latin word for Lent, and I'm going to put it below because I I just don't know how to say it. And I my husband knows Latin, but I I have not learned that language yet. Uh, so this word is is where Lent comes from, and it means forty. And if you're looking at it, then you might be able to guess what else it is the root word for, and that is quarantine. So quarantine and 40 and Lent are all wrapped up together, and I just feel like that is really apropos for the themes of this season in this particular year. Uh, I found that just amazing that, that 40 and Lent and quarantine are all bound up together. Uh, I don't know what you all think of that. Let me know in the comments below if you also find that very interesting. Apparently, uh, boats that would have plague, potential plague on them, would stay at bay for 40 days. Uh, so that's where we get the word quarantine, is that they would stay uh, out for 40 days and, and anything they thought was contaminated would stay out for 40 days. And uh, 40 days is obviously the length of Lent as well. So fun fact for the day. But why don't we go ahead and begin this Palm and Passion Sunday with our prayer of the day. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So again, these, these prayers of the day, they're kind of like a nice summary of the day's lessons. And Palm and Passion Sunday, not surprisingly, is all about the cross. It's all about the meaning of the cross and the meaning of Jesus' suffering and his death. Um, so I'm going to go over the readings, but uh, as usual with these web videos, I'm not going to do all, all the readings, but today I will do the longest reading. I've been skipping the longest reading and having you do those, but today uh, I will read the Passion Narrative with you, uh, at least one account of the Passion Narrative, because I, I think it's just, it's too important not to read together. I mean, all the scriptures are important, but I feel like if I were to not read the Passion Narrative on Passion Sunday, that would be a big misstep as a pastor. Uh, but we, we won't do the Palm 
procession together. Um, I've been thinking about how to do this in a webcast and I just haven't been able to think about how to do a palm procession um, while in our own homes. Um, so I'm going to give you the, the reading if you want to read Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And it's something we did as a Bible study at the beginning of Lent. So it is Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 11. So that's the palm. That's the palm and Palm Sunday. Our other readings for today are Isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 through 9. Psalm 31, verses 9 through 16. Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Uh, and there are two accounts of the Passion narrative you can read. The longer account is Matthew, chapter 26, verse, uh, starting with verse 14 and going to Matthew, chapter 27, verse 66. And the one that I will be reading for you today, and I'm going to put it up on, um, I'm going to put the words up on the screen too, is Matthew chapter 7, verses 11 through 54. This is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they are making against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Jesus Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The, gov the governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took some water, washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, see to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarter, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put a charge against him, which reads, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. 
Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads, saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, but he can't save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am the Son of God. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, the darkness came over the whole land until it was three in the afternoon. And at about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemam sabachthalachthim. That is to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. Then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out from the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what had taken place, they were terrified and said, Truly this man was the Son of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Before I get into the sermon that I've actually already written, I, I wanna I, I realize that there's something I, I should have put in my sermon that I didn't that I want to bring to your attention right now because especially in the Lutheran, the Lutheran history with Martin Luther, we've we've made some serious mistakes as as a church about how we have addressed uh, people of the Jewish faith, um, starting with Martin Luther, but continuing on through that. And part of that goes to how people have interpreted uh, what I just read about um, the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on his children. And they say, oh, well, you know, the Jews killed Jesus. Uh, so I want to say right now, that's not what you should take away from this story. And that's not the relationship we should have with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, if anyone killed Jesus, it's everybody. And it wasn't any one particular group of people that caused Jesus' death. It was the will of God, and it was what Jesus had set out to do from the very beginning. We knew that the crucifixion was going to be a part of this, and to blame any one people for being responsible of this, I, I, I hope that none of you do that. And I, um, if that, if you have questions about that, um, or if this is something that you grew up hearing, um, that, that the Jews caused Jesus to die and that this is, uh, you're, you're struggling with how to understand that, please come talk to me. Um, please come talk to me because I, I don't want us to have that kind of, of reading and interpretation of this text as a community. Um, cause that's not the God we have. We have a God who is centered on love, love and restoration of creation, uh, not a God of blame and, and not a God of hate. Uh, so I almost, I think that's more important than the sermon that I'm going to give. And again, if you have questions about that, um, come talk to me about it. Uh, you have my, my phone number and my email. I can include it in the, the information below. And so, so now the, the sermon that I, I have prepared for you, I, I'll get into that now. Um, 
So I'm actually going to start by, there's a lot of, a lot of things that are unusual about today. So I'm just going to start and, and give away the end of the sermon first. And that is that the story that we just heard, this passion narrative, is the most important story in the world. It is the very cornerstone of our faith that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only beloved son so that all who believed in him may not perish but have eternal life. Uh, that is, we could probably just end it right there for today, but what I want to explore with you is this question of, of why. Why is the cross important? Why is this the most important story in the world? Um, so let's get into that. And I want to start with, with maybe bringing up a memory that you might have of, of previous Holy Weeks. Now, on, on Good Friday, a lot of churches will process in the cross and, and they'll, they'll put it in the beginning, of, they'll put it in the front of the sanctuary. And I want you to, to just think of that for a moment and let's all imagine the cross for a moment. Behold the life-giving cross on which hung the Savior of the world. O come, let us worship him. I wonder what these words mean to you, what the cross means to you. Because of what Jesus accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection, the cross means something very different for us today than it did when Jerusalem was under Roman occupation. At the time of Jesus, the cross was the electric chair of the first century. It was the most extreme form of punishment, often reserved for political agitators, slaves, and the lowest of criminals. It was the death penalty accomplished in the most gruesome means. Only Jesus, both human and divine, could triumph through such a method. Only Jesus could take an electric chair and turn it into a throne from which the Son of Man is lifted up for the healing of the nations. Only Jesus could make this instrument of death into a means of new life forever. Maybe this is why we have Palm and Passion Sunday together, so that we can see more clearly what the early church called the triumph of the cross. It's a triumph that happens in a story filled with betrayal, denial, false accusations, unfair trials, and a brutal death. And what caught my attention on reading through the Passion narrative this year was the failures and misuse of power by the earthly leaders in the story. We didn't read this section together, but Peter, the rock of the church, denies Jesus three times. We pick up with Pilate, who may be a good guy caught in a tough situation, or he could also be seen as a someone skilled at public manipulation and presentation. This is the only gospel where Pilate washes his hands, which some scholars read as a cynical act of political theater. Then there are the leaders in the community who turn the crowd against Jesus during the trial. All around, it's a devastating portrayal of earthly leadership. And yet, God shows who is really in charge and who has the true power when, upon Jesus' death, the whole earth shakes, the temple curtain, that which symbolically separates people from the presence of God, is torn open, and the tombs of the saints are opened and their bodies resurrected. All of creation proclaims the power of the event that has just happened. The cross draws its power from the one who rules from it. And to understand who is lifted up on this strange throne, it helps to think back on who Jesus is in Matthew's gospel. From the very beginning, he's given the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And story after story, some of which we've read together this spring, show us that Jesus is God's very presence in our lives. 
Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to his people. He heals the sick, protects the poor, teaches men and women how to pray, loves the littlest and the least. Through Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells us what the cross will mean by telling us who he is, the ultimate manifestation of God's great love for us. He suffers as the great servant of all so that we may be freed from the powers of failed leadership and experience the new life that comes when death no longer has the final word. While Jesus, Jesus' unique life as God with us means that the cross is transformed into a throne from which endless mercies flow, it is still not easy to hear of the suffering of our Lord, even when we know the outcome. There's nothing easy about understanding why the cross is the throne of God because there's nothing easy about the cross. That Passion and Palm Sunday are the same day is a paradox, much like the cross itself is a paradox. Jesus came into the world not only as Emmanuel, God with us, but also as a human who feels his hands bound up and the slap of the soldier, who knows what it feels like to face the executioner's chair. But because Jesus is human and feels the weight of the cross, he knows the weight of our crosses. Just as Jesus is lifted up on the cross, he lifts up our crosses with him, taking our burdens upon him and releasing us from the power of sin and death. That's because the event of the cross reveals the very heart of God who willingly empties himself and suffers on behalf of the world so that all may be freed through his passion. We see God's love so clearly when he remembers when we remember his willingness to give himself fully so that we may live fully. Most importantly, the cross of Jesus always carries with it the promise of the resurrection to come. It always does that for Jesus and for us. That is why the cross still has meaning today, because of the resurrection. And that is why it is the most important story in the world. Behold the life-giving cross on which hung the savior of the world. Oh, come, let us worship him. I realized that I was so excited to tell you all about uh, what I learned about the word 40 and Lent and quarantine all being grouped together that I forgot to do our uh, joy stories. Um, and this is something I was talking about last week where I was at a church a few years ago where they started every worship service with joy stories, with stories of, of gratitude, of thanksgiving and um, of joy. And so in light of, of the message that I just gave about the cross and its meaning in our lives, I think now is a, is a good time to reflect on, on something we've witnessed this week that's brought joy to our hearts. So I want you to just pause for a minute and um, you can share in the comments below if you would like a moment this week where you have experienced God's presence. Um, 
a moment where you have had a moment of joy, gratitude, thanksgiving, and let me know in the comments below what that might be. Uh, for me, my joy story this week is uh, our relationship with our, our Presbyterian side of things, well, and our Lutheran side, but the Presbyterian side of, of our community this week um, with, with Katie Stark and Cheryl Kinder Pyle uh, brought some grant money to my attention that I applied for. And now our food pantry and our daycare are getting some additional funds. Our daycare has elected to stay open for um, the children of essential workers, um, but it's it's hard to do that with with the the center that we have and not get a, a bit of a, a loss in income because we we don't have that many families, but we really want to be there for them. And so that we were able to get some grant money to keep our center going uh, was a great joy that I heard about this week, and for our food pantry too, because as I mentioned last week. We have um, de decreased uh, resources because of the supply chain and where it is right now with grocery stores, but also an increased need. And so to get extra funding from the Presbytery to support our food pantry so that we can support the local families here in Wilbur is, is a great joy uh, that, that I've experienced this week. So again, what, what joys have you experienced this week? Where have you experienced God's presence? Uh, the next part of our service that I would like to do with you is our, our prayers of the people. And again, uh, just like I've been using, this is coming out of uh, Feasting on the Word. It's an ecumenical resource. Um, so it has writers from Lutherans, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and Methodists. So let's quiet our minds and hearts for a moment and pray for the world, the church, and all of those in need. We pray that Christians hear and share the word of God as true disciples. God of mercy, hear our prayer. That all the ends of the earth receive the word of the King of peace. God of mercy, hear our prayer. That all leaders of church and state prefer humble service to empty power. God of mercy, hear our prayer. That all people live with gratitude for the gifts of nourishment, friendship, family, trust, patience, and hope, with the courage and wisdom to change whatever fails to be life-giving. God of mercy, hear our prayer that those who see the cross starkly revealed in their lives draw strength from that name that is above every other name. God of mercy, hear our prayer. That we might live with gratitude for our ancestors whose faith and witness have nourished our own, that all who mourn today will be comforted and that we, who hope to greet Jesus when he comes again, will be ready and filled with joy. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God, our great creator, you show your sons and daughters the way to freedom through the gentle obedience of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And uh, typically in our church here, Wilbur Community Church, we close our service out with the Our Father. And um, I was reading in, in my Bible this week, and I, I'm reading a different translation. A lot of times I talk to you about uh, favorite translations, and one of mine is the Common English Bible. And it, it's very accurate to the Greek, but also uses contemporary language as well. And um, so I was reading through the Our Father as it is in Matthew's Gospel, and it's just, uh, it's very 
refreshing reading it in a in a, a newer translation just because I don't know it takes something familiar and kind of adds a different lens to it so I'd like to read to you um, this is out of the common English Bible and and Matthew's account of the Lord's Prayer our Father who is in heaven uphold the holiness of your name bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us bread that we need for today. Forgive us the ways we have wronged you, just as we forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Thank you so much for participating in this highly unusual Palm and Passion Sunday and what will surely be an unusual Holy Week. I hope that you can join me this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. In the spirit of Holy Week, I was thinking about contemplative practices that would be good for, for this week's themes. And so on Wednesday, we'll do a Jesuit prayer that's called the Examine. And it's about um, examining our own day and how God has been present and how we have um, worked towards God's will and how we haven't, uh, what our shortcomings have been. And so given that this is a very reflective time of year, uh, I, th I thought this would be a good practice for us to learn. It's, it's not strictly a contemplative prayer practice, but I think it, it's, it's a good fit for the needs of this week and the resources that we have in our homes. So thank you again for, for joining me today. Please uh, stay home, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time. I'll leave you today with the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.